So I remember thinking when I sign up, I'm going to give a hundred percent. I'm going to do this a hundred percent. If they're only doing 50% percent, they're selling 40 homes a year. Shit. Like if I go a hundred percent, I could really do something here. And I knew I was good at sales. I just didn't know what to do. And so I did, I went a hundred percent in and that's why, you know, my first full year with coaching, I did 98 sales with just one assistant. I ended up being one of the two finalists for salesperson of the year on the Salt Lake Board of Realtors because I finally knew what to say. I knew how to say it. And then honestly, this is the success formula. What is up, everybody? This is Scorch the Fears with the great Jimmy Rex. I'm really glad to have him here. I met you first time at Avengers. You were an amazing speaker. I really loved your vibe, love what you were doing with like your men's program and all that stuff. I grew up in doing men's programs, different types of men's programs, and we'll get into what that is and who you are and all that. But first off, I just want to say thank you, man. Thank you for making the time and coming on here today. Yeah, Jonah, no, it's a pleasure, man. I enjoyed meeting you as well and excited to dig into some stuff. For sure. So real quick, just introduce yourself to everybody who doesn't know who you are, because, yeah, I just want you to introduce like what you're doing, what you've done in the past, all that good stuff. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I was a full-time real estate agent, ran a big team for about 17 years. I still have a team now that runs, but I turned that over to my partner about a, a little over a year ago. About two years ago, year and, a, year, year and a half ago, I started a men's group called We Are The They, and, and it's to help men become the best version of themselves through building community, being vulnerable, authentic, in an integrity. And we do a lot of like high adventure and just, just do a lot of deep diving into life and connecting and things like that. And so because that took off, like that's why I turned real estate over full time to my team. I've got about 500 guys in that group now that I coach in a year and a half. And uh, yeah, before I got into real estate, I was a serial entrepreneur. I had four or five businesses. I did a TV show called Not On The First Date, where we uh, filmed people on blind dates. I had a Christmas light company and you know, I've had a side gig pretty much always doing different random things. I had a meat company. We sold steak and chicken door to door that we franchised and did some things. And so yeah, just always kind of being a serial entrepreneur, but real estate, related has been most of my businesses you know i've had a business flipping homes uh, a lot of real estate investing and that's uh, kind of how i built my career was we really focused with investors and helping them do it the right way and so that's kind of my real estate or life career in a, in a nutshell love it so you were mainly would you say your main business was just traditional real estate like being a real estate agent yeah yeah for all those years i you know my team in my first full year as real estate agent, it's 2005, and I sold 60 homes by myself. Wow. My, my second year, I sold 98 homes with me and one assistant, and it was kind of off to the races, right? And then by the time I turned it over to my team, I think my last full year in the business, we did 497 homes with you know about four of us on the team. And again, we just one house at a time, man, just slamming homes all day long. That's what we did. I like it. And I like that phrase. I mean, it's something that I've heard a lot just in general with entrepreneurship was like, what it's your one more call away your one just do just focus on the next house don't focus on the next 50 houses otherwise you're gonna get intimidated but i wanted your opinion on when you were starting in entrepreneurship whether it was being a real estate agent any of your past businesses what fears were you dealing with what fears were you dealing with when that started how did you overcome those fears to be doing all the stuff you're doing now yeah, it's such a good question. I, that's what I love about your podcast. You know, it's interesting. When I started having success pretty early with those first couple of years being so good, my big fear became that I wouldn't be able to keep doing it. And people would say, I mean, my biggest fear for a decade was people will look at me and say, that guy used to be something. And it sounds like such an irrational fear, but it was really difficult to not feel that because the markets were changing, right? Like, you know, I had to go through 08, 09, 010, where it was brutal, uh, really hard to sell real estate. And you're just hanging on, you're just hanging on. And I remember always having that fear in the back of my mind of like, gosh, if this doesn't work out, people be like, man, that guy used to be so good or what happened to him. And I watched it happen with other realtors that had been really good and they fell off. And, and I, you know, it was, that was, I just didn't want to be that guy. And so that was always in the back of my mind. So that's one thing that comes to my mind. And then there's the fear of being successful, to be honest, like it's a real fear because what happens, I, I in fact, I had a friend ask me last night, 
it was my buddy's wife. She said, is it ever a little bit difficult to have your entire life is kind of on the stage or on display a little bit? And to hers, that was like the most terrifying thing ever. And there is a little bit of fear of like, geez, like once you've kind of put yourself out there, you can't really put the genie back in the bottle. And so you're just out there, your life's out there. You're And, and I think that that's not so much of a fear as just a reality of like, man, okay, this is, it, it's, it's really good accountability. And so as far as that works, but sometimes, it, you know, it would be nice to just take a week or two and not have to worry about anything and not have to worry where you're going or what, you know, like how you're showing up or whatever. And so those are a couple of the ones that come to my mind. I think when I very first was starting out in um, real estate, I wasn't really afraid if I was going to succeed or not. I feel like in my mind, I always knew I would. So I wasn't really afraid of that. And I always kind of was just, oh, for whatever it doesn't work, I'll do the next thing. I'd been doing so many different little entrepreneur businesses. And I think it was a gift that I have. This is actually important to touch on, I think, is, you know, I did. So when I was just 21 years old, I just came back from a, a Mormon mission. So I was kind of first going into the workplace. I did a, the, this TV show. And it, again, it was called Not on the First Date. And I just had an idea. I thought it was funny. I thought it'd be funny to follow my friends around right home when they got home off their missions. We were so awkward. Wait, and how do so, you get onto a TV show? Or how do you start a TV show? Like, I it just, sounds like it, I literally did. just created it. Yeah, it was and literally then found a network because like a TV that like you have to convince somebody to also put it on TV. <laughs> yeah. So the way it worked is I had the idea and I was telling my buddy about it. He's like, well, you should make the TV show. And I was like, you know what? Cool. I'll do it. And so I started researching basically how you'd make a TV show. And I found a camera guy that had done some commercials and stuff and asked if he'd partner with me. And then I I started going business to business, asking them if we could come to their business to film the dates. And then I found a buddy that edited videos back then, you know, I mean, it's 2003. These, I remember that this big old Mac thing, things probably a, worth a ton of money these days just because it's so old but and i asked him if i could hire him to edit so we filmed the first episode i'm like one of the two camera guys i mean i'm just trying to make this thing and then and this is how old we were too this is this is like before youtube was even a thing we took the raw footage i put it on i burned it onto a disc i fed it to my buddy that went to ucla he's a comedian we would watch them together and then we would write the jokes of like when we were going to make fun of them and all these different things. And then I would take it to my other dude and we would edit it up. So I remember I made the first two episodes and each one was like 20 minutes, you know, and they were funny. And I knew I had something funny, but I, from there it's like, yeah, how do you get it on TV? So I started researching and I found out you can buy the airtime on like Saturday mornings at 10 AM. Oh no. Did I lose them randomly? We might have just lost Jimmy. He just like went black. I'm curious if his phone just died. Well, either way, I'm going to entertain you guys. Wait, let's see here for a second. Oh, we might have just lost Jimmy. I'm curious if his phone died or not. Hmm. You there? Oh, lost him. It seems like I lost him, got him, and then lost him. Well, anyways, Jimmy's still going to be back. I have, I have faith that he's going to be back. He's going to pop back in here. Oh, there we go. Sorry, dude. I don't hey. Know. Sorry, dude. I don't know what happened there. It got cut <laughs> I off. thought your phone died. I was like, No, oh, no. Wow. Phone's fully charged. I don't know what's going on. I'm having tech issues today, but <laughs> you edit this, right? Like we can. Yeah, it'll be edited. Don't okay, worry. so I'll, I'll jump back into the story where it was. But so anyway, so I knew that you could buy the airtime on TV like at 10 a.m. on a Saturday or whatever, like as a worst case scenario. So I'm going around to these different TV stations. And what happened, I just took them the, the raw episodes that we had and I got denied by the first three episodes, but the or, uh, news stations, TV stations, but the fourth TV station was called KJazz. It was the local station that like the Utah jazz was on. It was a lot of local TV and they watched the episode. They loved it. And they put it, they made us a deal right there. And long story short, we ended up becoming the number one TV show on Sundays in Utah. And like, yeah, and so it was a grind to just pump these things out quick enough. And, and anyway, so that's how you come up with a TV show, man. So like Very I said, funny. but what would happen? So my point of that was, is so I do this TV show. And by all means, it was a failure. We lost money. Like I made sure everybody got paid but me, but I wasn't bringing enough money in to make it worth keep doing. And so I had to shut it down. We just did the one season. But to everybody on the outside, so like, again, this was a failure, quote unquote, but to everybody on the outside, it was this resounding success. And so this is where I had this huge benefit that 
what would feel like a failure to everybody else was I saw it as success. And so even though I did the show and it didn't really go anywhere, I didn't really make any money. It, it was a success. And then I had my meat business and I set that up and we ran it for three years. And we Real framed- quick, just because I want sorry to interrupt you, but I'm curious like to you, what made that a success? Because in one way, it was financially a failure. Mm-hmm. But are you saying just because you even got it on TV, it was a success, basically? I'm saying, yeah, in the eyes of everybody else, they're like, dude, look at Jimmy. He's putting himself out there. He's doing this crazy thing. Like, that's really cool. And that's what the perception to everybody else was. And so, and, and I mean, I got to know every business owner in town. We went to every restaurant in town. So I had these connections with my network built really quickly. I was able to connect with a lot of people around town as far as like for dating and stuff, because that's who was on my show. I mean, I had 24 episodes. So, yeah, you know, there's 24 guys, 24 girls right there alone that I got to know pretty well. And then with the meat companies, the same thing though, is like, we built this up for three years. My partner ended up stealing a bunch of our money. Long story short, I got stuck with $110,000 debt. I'm 24 years old and got this crazy debt. And so I shut down the meat company, had to pay that off. So when I got into real estate, I started with this debt, which ended up being a huge uh, blessing because I was so hungry to get rid of the debt. But again, to the outside, like to me, it was a failure. I lost this money. Like I got stuck with all this debt, but to the outside, it was like, wow, Jimmy built this meat company and did this whole thing. And so I had this advantage that every time I tried something, even if it was a financial failure, I was being seen as a success. And so all my fear of trying or taking action or just doing something went away. And that's such a gift because most people get caught up in the like, I'm not going to do this if it's not going to work. I don't know if it's going to work. And to me, the failure was only in not trying something. And so it really empowered me to do all these other things that I did and to just just try. And so I would try these investments. I would try this. And a lot of things didn't work, man. But then I learned so much. And all of a sudden, you know, after failure, after failure financially, a couple of things worked really well. And then next thing you know, you're kind of set up for life. And so that is the thing that I think was most important for my story is learning that just like failure is in not doing something. Failure is not in it not working. That was every one of those things that didn't work was a huge gift for me. It's really interesting. I really, that's a really interesting part of your story that I don't really feel like I've gotten into with a decent amount of people where even, even failures are successes. Even if it's like a financial failure in the sense that maybe you lost money on a deal or maybe you lost money in a business but the fact that you're trying things, you're still gaining the skills, you're gaining the knowledge, and also you're showing people that you're legitimate and you're doing things too. So your family and friends, it sounds like, are believing you're going somewhere, right? Yeah, and, and it also opened up doors that I otherwise would have never had open because I was meeting all these business owners and I was just a hustler, dude. I was just trying shit, you know, and people loved it. And so I ended up getting doors opening for me in my 20s. I had no business being in these rooms. Like I was get, able to connect and and hang out and really become friends with some of the most powerful people in town. And it was all because I was this guy taking action. Like people just want to be around that guy. You know, they would love it. They'd like, do we just want you there? Like come like your energy, you know, we just want you to come enjoy. And, and so I got to really be around these amazing people that ended up blessing me a lot later on in life. I love it. So, yeah. So it's just, it is interesting to think about how I, you got, you, it seemed like there were like two different things that were happening at the same time in my head of like just listening to your story already. One is that, you had the positive reinforcement of like, I am able to do really cool things. I'm really able to hang out with really cool people. I know this stuff is going to work eventually. And then also you do still have the hunger in you because it's like, well, I'm still not making the money right now. So I really do need the money. So those I've noticed that those two things, usually a positive reinforcement and then a negative reinforcement do a lot to push somebody forward into whatever they're going to do in their career. So how do you find out about real estate? Because those, those, it's just such random different things. It's like a TV show, meat company, real estate. Like how how do you learn about real estate? How did you get into real estate? Yeah, and I think that was part of my story. Is I was just trying to figure out. I mean, here's the thing: when you're younger, you want to be rich, right? Like you want to have money when you're older. You want to have a life that has you know some luxury and some things. And and nobody really knows if they're gonna have that when you're a kid, but you're hopeful. And when I started selling meat door to door, that was kind of when my eyes really opened up because I mean, I, I could make 800 to a thousand bucks a day selling steak and chicken door to door. Like I was really good at it. And then my first day out on the doors in an hour and a half, I made like 300 bucks and I was like, oh my gosh, like 
I'm going to have money. Like it was and just how this many real chickens life. and steaks is that? I'm yeah, curious each, how each many case is it like would, chicken? Each case had like 50 pieces of meat. And I would sell 10 of these cases in like an hour or two. You know, I'd just be like, if you buy one, I'll give you two for free. And I mean, markup was huge. So you just make this giant spread, a couple hundred bucks. So like, if I sold three cases, I'd make like 200 bucks. And I do that three, four times. So I'm selling 10, 12 cases of meat and, you know, making three, four big sales and a thousand bucks for the day. And so, but what that did too, though, is, you know, so I started having that success and I learned, okay, I'm going to be able to have money or whatever else. And so from there, I really started playing with like, well, what do I want to do? And when I was younger, where real estate came in is I knew that was the investment vehicle to really get wealthy. I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'd gotten some CDs from a friend of mine. Like they don't even exist anymore. We're talking like Carlton Sheets, No Money Down, Robert Allen, like some of these weird programs that were out there. But what it did is it got my mind going, ooh, real estate's the answer to, to this. And so I just wanted to know everything I could about real estate. So I originally got my license simply to do my own real estate investments. And again, I was just entrepreneurial. I just wanted to try things, you know, I didn't know it was going to work. And when I got into real estate, I hired this coach, a guy by the name of Mike Ferry. And well, my first six months in real estate were pretty stagnant, to be honest. I sold like three homes, didn't know if I was going to keep doing it. I was like, gosh, I don't know if this is for me. And then I hired this coach. And when I got him, my next, by the end of that first year, I'd sold 60 homes. I sold like 55 homes my next six months and it was off to the races. Can we and, talk, sorry, sorry to interrupt you again. I, this is what I do in my interview style is if I hear something interesting and I really cool. want to dive deep in, I really want you to dive deep into your coach and what that, the difference a coach made in your life. Because I think this is something a lot of people miss when they're thinking like, oh, I want to save money. Do I really need a coach? I feel like I can learn it on YouTube, but real quick, talk about like how much coaching is helped your life and you can it's and this coach specifically yeah i mean and again at the time i'd never had a coach before and i was pretty broke i mean i didn't have a ton of money real estate was floundering and i got this flyer i don't even know how it ended up in my desk but i pulled it out one day and it was for the next day it was this seminar that was going as a three-day seminar and my problem with real estate at the time is i didn't know how to call for sale by owners i didn't know how to have a strong listing presentation i didn't know what to say to the clients i didn't know how to find deals and that was really frustrating because I just didn't know where to go for it. And in this flyer, it was like, learn how to do all these things I wanted to do. I'm like, man, that's, that's pretty good. And it was, I remember it was 500 bucks. And I was just like, oh man, this is, this is a real stretch for me. But I decided to, you know, do it. I put it on a credit card. And the first day of the event, I go and I'll never forget, like, I loved it. I loved what they were teaching. I love it. It was skills I didn't have. It was mindset that I didn't have. And at the end of the day, they gave us this homework assignment to go home and do these calls a certain way using this certain script. And I did it and I got a couple of really good leads and I was like, damn, this, this stuff works. And so I went back the second day and same thing, but they, you know, they pitched the program as a thousand dollars a month. I and mean, that was my mortgage. was like $900 a month. I had a house and I was like, these people are insane. And you know, I'm 24 years old at this point. I got all this debt still. And, and day two of the event, same thing. Though. I'm like, man, this information is so good. And I went home and did the homework assignment and got a couple more leads again. So day three, I remember I went up to the guy that was hosting the program. He's actually having me speak at his seminar in October this year, which is just kind of fun little how, you know, everything works. But I, I remember listening to him and, and I went up to him and I had the form that you fill out to sign up for coaching. I said, hey, man, I, if you run this right now, it's, it's not going to work. Like my credit card isn't going to go through. But if you hold it till this date, and I wrote it on there, I said, I got a deal closing, I'm ready to go all in. And so I took the jump, they held my card till then. And I knew that if I was going to do this, I needed to go all in. And I remember that seminar, the one of the things that stood out to me the second day we were there, it was at the Marriott downtown in Salt Lake. And there was a Jamba Juice out in the lobby. I remember grabbing a Jamba Juice and there was a bunch of the people that were in coaching were there and they were wearing this lanyard that said they were in coaching. And so I started talking to them and four or five agents all from the same brokerage that all did this coaching program. I said, hey, you guys, looks like you're signed up for this. Does this stuff really work? And they are all like, oh yeah, it works. And I was like, how many homes do you guys sell a year? You know, it was like 20, 40, 50, 15, whatever. I'm like, damn, okay. I'm selling four at the time, you know? And so I'm like, wow, okay. And I asked him, I said, well, what percentage of the stuff do you do? And I remember they laughed like I was the idiot. They're like 25%, 30%. Because they were saying you got to call three hours a day. You got to role play for an hour a day. You've got to do lead follow-up for a day. And then you go on appointments for three hours a day. And I'm just like, 
to me, I had been a Mormon missionary where you start at 9 a.m. on the doors and you knock doors till 9 p.m. And you did that every day. Like that was what you did for two years. And in the morning you studied for three hours and, you know, I mean, just very rigid schedule. So for me, I had and I it was in Spanish. And so I had to learn these scripts in Spanish, what to say, basically. I mean, I was learning Spanish, what to say before I knew what I was saying. I didn't even know what the words were. I was memorizing sounds, basically. And so I had no problems with scripts and role play and all those things. And I remember thinking to myself when I asked those agents, I'm like, these guys are idiots. Like, if it's working, why don't you just do 100%? And I asked them that. And they just laughed like, well, it's really hard to do it. So I remember thinking when I sign up, I'm going to give 100%. I'm going to do this 100%. If they're only doing 50%, they're selling 40 homes a year. Shit. Like if I go 100%, I could really do something here. And I knew I was good at sales. I just didn't know what to do. And so I did. I went 100% in. And that's why, you know, my first full year with coaching, I did 98 sales with just one assistant. I ended up being one of the two finalists for salesperson of the year on the Salt Lake Board of Realtors because I finally knew what to say. I knew how to say it. And then, honestly, this is the success formula for any realtor. But the only other thing you have to do is do it all day. Once you know what to say, once you learn how to say it really well, there's no new objections. And so at that point, I was just calling for sell by owners three, four hours a day. I was calling my SOI for an hour or two a day and just freaking grinding, making things happen. And it, it took off, man. And I mean, coaching changed everything. I love it so much. Like, so you were, you were broke though. You didn't, you like barely had enough money. You were just like, I like what made you willing to do it. Right. Cause I think that's really key for people who are broke and are like, man, I don't have $10,000 for a coaching program or whatever. whatever yeah. It's a it good, is. it's a good question. And here's what I knew. I said, if I don't do this, nothing is going to change. Mm -hmm. Like I knew that. And so I said, I just trusted it. I mean, honestly, without the homework assignments, I don't think I'd have had the balls to do it, but it was working. I got five leads in two days, like five of my best leads in months. I was like, geez, this, this works. I need to do this. And so for me, it was Jimmy, if you want something to change, you got to change something. And I knew if I went all in that I would make it work. And so that gave me the confidence to do it. But it was a decision that I made before. I said, if I'm going to spend this money, I'm going to make sure it works. I mean, I went all in and uh, that thousand dollars, that freaking stung. Like I knew it was going to, but I felt like I had to, if I wanted things to change, like that was going to catapult my whole career, which it did. I really like it. I mean, I feel like you probably heard this phase before. It's like when you look there's like the cost of the education, but then there's also the cost of not doing the education or not mm. becoming educated. And that's something that I feel like I've just learned through entrepreneurship is that you always, it is almost always worth it to pay for education. Like if it's good education, if you vet the people and make sure they actually are doing deals and that it's actually going to make you money. Like if you're actually going to go all in, then it's, you're going to get your ROI as long as you learn from the right people and they have the right heart. That's been my experience too. Yeah. And well, and to your point, you know, like once my coaching with Mike Ferry worked so well, I mean, I was crushing it. I had deals coming out of everywhere. Um, you know, I signed up for another program, a guy named Craig Proctor. I went to his seminar and signed up for his coaching. And it was, again, it was a thousand dollars. By then I was making some good money. So I was like, cool with it. And if I'm being honest, that was the worst coaching ever. Like it was awful. It was <laughs> terrible terrible total waste of money and so you know finding the right coaching is i did get a little lucky that i mean now that i know the industry like mike ferry who i joined is the best like that guy's the goat especially for just learning how to build habits and skills and you know and just really becoming good at what you do and so i got a little bit lucky but at the same time you have to try stuff you know and it doesn't always work i mean one of the things with my coaching program now with we are the they i took i mean i've in my search of trying to become a better version of myself, I went to, after that coaching work too with real estate. I'm like, you know, years later, I'm like, I want to keep expanding. And I was like, well, if it worked in real estate, I'm going to go try other coaching. So I did Tony Robbins coaching and I did all these programs. I went to every seminar, conference, mastermind, read hundreds of books on self-development. Like I did all this stuff. And what's cool with my program is I took all the best stuff from 10 years of just being on this grind of trying to find um, how to become a better version of myself. I took all that stuff and I put it into this program of two and a half years. So I just took all the best stuff we did through all the bullshit. And that's what my program is now. But it took me going through all of that. I mean, I, I did a lot of stuff that was awful. I mean, I remember going to seminars that were just complete dog shit, you know, and but I found a lot of stuff that was really impactful and powerful as well. And then I just put my spin on it. 
How do you how do you find the right coach? Like I, I honestly, my story is like you. I got lucky as well. I'm I'm like a student of Pace and Jamil, which I I know you both know both of them. Yeah. But like, how do you how do you how would you say someone that like they're like, hey, how do I know whether a coach is legit or if they're the right person or if I should do that coaching program? Yeah, I think the key to coaching program is you find somebody that has the life or that is has the career that you really want, like that you want to emulate, and then find out either what their coaching is or who their coach is, who they go to. So find out that's a really good way to find people that are like, like you're listening to this right now. Like you can go sign up for Mike Ferry. If you really want to get good at your skills, like Mike Ferry, you're listening to this. You're, okay. I can trust that that's going to work. Right. And you know, I'm sure there's people that got Craig Proctor to work. Probably not very many. It was pretty bad. But my point is, is like talk to people that have done it and then they'll be honest with you. People that are honest about it. Cause a lot of times we want to look where people are in their career and they're like what's jimmy doing today like today my coach i have three coaches one of them's ed my he's my one-on-one coach you don't need that right now like that wouldn't help you right now like i'm in a different thing trying different things with my career but if you look at where i'm at today you'd be like oh shit i need to get ed because i want to have what jimmy's doing like no, no no that's not what got me there like look at the actual history or the story or you know the background of what helps somebody where did they learn where did they you know really break in at and that's the person you want to go find and hire for yourself i love it i like that a lot i like that a lot too in the sense that i think people jump coaches i've actually noticed like for me i love having pace and jamil as my coaches and they are incredibly useful but i also have people who i consider mentors maybe not as much coaches i didn't pay them but like in some ways they're more useful because they're one step ahead of me while pace and jamil are like 20 steps ahead of me it's good to have a mix but like if they're too far ahead of you they actually become useless yeah, like exactly i already right. know for me ed Milet would be kind of useless for me at the moment like in one day he'll be very useful when i'm doing millions and millions in business instead of a million in business right but i do but anyways i do like that advice as well so yeah. let's keep going with the story so you sign up for the coaching program you're starting to become the best real estate agent in utah and then it sounds like we're getting to 2007, 2008. How did you pivot in like that down market, especially as a real estate agent? You might be the only real estate agent I heard who didn't take a break. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, honestly, it was brutal, man. You know, I mean, and by the way, the hardest part was in 2007. Remember, I sold 98 homes. I was 25 years old. I was right. on top of the world. Like everybody knew I was this huge success story. I was getting put on front stages in front of 2000 people to show them what I was doing. Like everyone in my friends group was like, Jimmy has all this money. And that money was not because I didn't know how to budget. I was way overspending on different things. And so to the outside, it was like, wow, Jimmy's got all this stuff going, which honestly made it harder because I was broke. And there was multiple times I'd tell my assistant to hold his check. I'm like, bro, here you go. And this ain't going to go through till we close another house. And so it was brutal. I mean, it was really hard. You know, I remember one of the things that made it so hard was you have to, this is, a, I think, an important part too, is you have to have a vision for where you're going. People too often when they're trying to work out of a, a bad spot, they focus on what's in front of them. And so for me, it wasn't very motivating to pay off debt. It wasn't very motivating to just pay my bills. And so if I was focused on what was right in front of me, it made it really hard to get on the phones and prospect and do my work. However, if I focused on what I wanted or who I wanted to be one day, it made it really easy. So I had a quote on my wall. I had this prospecting booth that I would go in and make my calls every day, every morning for years, for five years, I never missed. And the quote on the wall right by the phone where I'd pick it up, it was a, I just had a dial up phone because I'd leave my cell phone out of there to not distract me. And every single day that I'd go in there and this quote said, show up today for your future self because you never know who's going to need you. Because in the moment, there was no benefit. Like it's so non-rewarding to go make these sales and just paying off debt, paying off bills, like just floating above water. But I knew, I said, Jimmy, if you quit today, there's going to be opportunities that you'll never have later on. And who knows who needs you later. And, you know, I've had the chance to go undercover with Operation Underground Railroad. For those that have seen the new movie, The Sound of Freedom, I went on 12 ops with that group and helped rescue. Oh, I helped rescue over 100 kids. Like I've, that's one of the gifts of my life is being able to do that. I, I didn't know if I hadn't kept going in that time, that wouldn't have worked. I've been able to have We Are The They Now, this men's group where every single day we're having these men are having these giant breakthroughs and things, you know, men talking about being sexually assaulted as kids or just whatever they're going through. And it's building community guys that 
had no clue where to find good people, have best friends for life. Now, I mean, yesterday, one of our guys had a birthday. He just threw a thing out, a text to the group. You know, he had 30 people there show up for his birthday lunch at Texas Roadhouse. Like, it was freaking insane. And, you know, 11 guys went to the demolition derby last night. Six guys went boating. And it's like this whole community that's building is just the most beautiful thing I've ever been able to be a part of. And this is what I envisioned back in those days. And I get emotional sometimes talking about it because it was so hard to sell real estate there. It was so hard to stay focused. It was so hard to get yourself on the phones. But I knew I was like, and people say like, well, how'd you really get through it or whatever? And it's like, I always had this thought in the back of my mind. I'm like, if I quit, like, I'll just be a loser. I'm like, what's the other option then? You go to work. Like, I'm not going to be a loser. And so there is no other. I'm like, how did I get through it? Well, I didn't want to be a loser. I don't know. I just want my life to mean something. I want my life to be something. And so I just kept pushing and kept grinding. And, you know, as long as you never give up the game, you win the game. Like, eventually you figure it out. Eventually you get money again. Eventually you work out of your debt. And I just one day at a time, man, just freaking one sell at a time. And I can't tell you how many times you know, I got that cell right when I needed to, to keep things going or whatever, but, but it just, just kept going. That's what I did. And it just worked really hard. I was working those 70, 80 hour weeks. I would, I joke around now. I'm like, I would never be able to work that hard again. No way. Like <laughs> I, I just wouldn't, I, it was such a grind. I'm so grateful I did it then. And that's the beauty though, is you don't always have to grind like crazy. I did then, but that's why I don't have to now. It's a completely different kind of work. Cool, man. So how do people reach out to you? How do people jo like apply for the program or join the program? Or Yeah, so you, go uh, to my Instagram and follow me there. That's where I share everything that I do. I'm speaking at a big event in September. We got, you know, Gary V, D Dave Goggins, myself, Ed Milet, Andy Fursell, all taking the stage together. There's going to it's gonna be a huge event. I post stuff like that. I post my podcast episodes every week. I post, you know, I just had Manti Teo on the Notre Dame linebacker. I just had on this guy named Nick Yaris that was in, wrongfully in prison for 22 years. I just get interesting people every week. I post all that on my Instagram and there's a link in my bio on Instagram that has all the links to my program and explains everything in detail. So that's where you can find me at. And yeah, man, reach out if you're, if this is calling to you and let's talk, let's, let's get together. I love it. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You, if you got somewhere to go, you can stay after for a little bit. I want to, I want to ask you a question also off the air too, but guys, thank you guys so much for coming on. This was Scorch the Fears with Jimmy Rex. Amazing guy. Amazing time. That was a cool story. Appreciate you. And do you have any last words for the people? You know, consistency over time is what wins in life, guys. We think there's going to be this one thing that changes your life and it's just doing the right thing over and over again. That's where you build a beautiful life. Love it. All right, guys. I will see you guys Thursday. We'll be back in our regular time. See y'all later. Let's freaking go.